Okay, and I'll have uh, the, the, the representatives to introduce themselves. And we're gonna go ahead and get started with the presentation. There's gonna be some time for Q&A. Uh, feel free to type in your question uh, in the chat. And uh, during the session, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask questions directly. So thank you. And uh, John, I guess we'll start with you. Yeah, thanks, Luke. I really appreciate it. Hi, everybody. And good afternoon, good morning to you. And um, really um, appreciate the opportunity here to present the California State University system. Um, I was working with my colleagues and we had a, um, a thought that we like to kind of give a perspective from the California State University system, which um, is something that is unique in, this, in the United States um, because we consist of 23 campuses. So without um, getting into this, you can see the agenda that, we're, that we have for today. And I wanna start off by introducing Chad and have him introduce himself and then we'll go along to Miffy and then after that we'll start the presentation. So we'll start it off Chad. Hi everybody, Chad Shemp, Senior Director of Recruitment and International Programs for San Diego State. Yeah, happy to be here, happy to help. I've um, met many of you at some point. I, I travel the world quite a bit recruiting you know, boots on the ground face to face and I also obviously with everything going on it's nice to get the virtual platform, you know, up and running and the libraries built up for all of you guys in different regions. So happy to be here. Look forward to giving you all the information. We're here for you. So, you know, feel free to get bombard us with as many questions as you like. And I'll turn it over to Miffy. Hi, everyone. My name is Miffy Yuan. Originally, I have, I was, I mean, I was born and raised in China. So I, I was an international student uh, myself before. And uh, I'm now working at SDSU as a recruiting coordinator for international marketing and recruiting. So I'm very glad that we had this opportunities to uh, meet with you guys virtually and hopefully our information uh, presented tonight will be uh, useful and can be um, useful tools for you when you um, communicate with your prospective student. And um, so thank you for uh, joining us tonight. And I believe that we also have one more representative from our campus, from SDSU, that just uh, just joined. Um, so, I, okay. Eddie, are you here? Yeah, hi, everyone. I apologize coming just a minute or two late. Just uh, work with Chad and Miffy very closely at San Diego State. I also uh, just got back from about a seven-hour road trip from beautiful Northern California. I, could, I felt the John Green energy as I was dro driving through Sonoma um, and just arrived back in San Diego. But I, I work really closely with Chad and Miffy, and um, I know uh, the network so well and respect the work that Education USA does so, um, so much and really just grateful for the opportunity to, to plug in. I'll, I'll be more in the background because, as you can see, I'm a little bit of a mess. So <laughs> apologies for that. <laughs> Great. Good to have you here, Eddie. Um, so let's just get through this. Uh, it's going to be about 40 minutes. We want to get through a lot of this um, information. There's a ton of information and this is kind of high level stuff. And then through all of us here, we can kind of answer all your questions, uh, especially if you have things about specifically with the state of California. So let's kind of get into it. So the California State University system, as you can see, is the nation's largest and most adverse um, system of universities in the United States it used to be the largest in the world and the out of the you know almost 500,000 students and that are spread across these 23 campuses is a very large budget and very large impact on the state of California and from the bottom of Southern California all the way up until uh, Humboldt State right by the Oregon border you can see that our campuses are spread mostly around um, uh, city centers, um, at like especially down looking in the San Diego area, um, but there are some that are also more rural. So there's um, universities that focus on agriculture, there's universities that have their business, there's universities that have microbiology and marine biology, and there's ones that are higher ranked, ones that are lower ranked. And so it goes from 1,000 students all the way up into almost 40,000 students at Cal State Fullerton. And so what we want to do is kind of highlight um, not so much these campuses. I think you can reach out and use us as um, references to reach out and some, talk to some of these universities if you haven't 
talked to some of the representatives already. So I, we're going to spin through some of the pictures here that I wanted to show. And you know, start off with San Diego State University down in Southern California and move it up the coast to San Marcos. And then Cal State Fullerton, their beautiful campus, along also over to, I believe that's um, San Bernardino campus. And then we have, um, this is CSU Long Beach. You can tell by their triangle or their pyramid basketball court. Then you get to Cal State LA, and then you get Northridge. And Channel Islands, a smaller, but one that's coastal, that's the newest CSU system, Dominguez Hills. We got Cal Poly Slow, San Luis Obispo, over to, this is Fresno State University. And then we also have Cal Poly Pomona, so the two Cal Poly schools are represented in the CSU system. And then we have Bakersfield, and now we're moving up north, getting across from the Southern California to Northern California to CSU Monterey Bay slipping into CSU East Bay, the big uh, San Jose State University in Silicon Valley, and then looking Eastern over in Modesto area, next to the UC Merced is CSU Stanislaus, and then the bigger campus downtown San Francisco is San Francisco State University, and then the tiny Cal State Maritime, which is like a teaching university, teaches people how to sail giant ships, um, not very many international students there at all. It's very kind of restrictive to international students in general that can go to that school, but it's just well represented right by Oakland. And then coming to my university, Sonoma State University, and then moving to, um, that's um, Sacramento State University, Chico State, great agriculture university, mechanical engineering, and great programs there. And then finally ending up by the Northern Coast, which is Humboldt State University. So as you can see from that earlier map that I showed you, we're spread up and down the coast of California, inland of California, 23 campuses, and then there's nine UC campuses, so 43 altogether, that's the same amount as universities that's in Australia, I believe, and then add on another 300 more universities, so there's colleges and universities all across the state of California. This breaks down the populations, and you can see where San Diego is ranked up in the top five um, largest universities. And then Sonoma State, where I uh, represent, um, we're down in the bottom five. And so there's a vast disparity of the different populations at the um, California State University campuses. And, you know, all adds up to, you know, the largest system in the United States. This is a breakdown of the levels, and you can see that you know, because we're um, where the UCs are research university, predominantly research, California State Universities are teaching universities. And so the professors are tenured professors, and their goal is to teach the students. Um, they do have research and they do have publishing responsibilities, but their first goal for tenured professors are to be teaching the students. And so we're predominantly, from that perspective, undergraduate heavy institutions. This breaks down the international enrollment. So unlike some of the UCs that are up, you know, all basically over 10% up to 20%, you can see that the CSU system, at least for international populations, um, has around 4%, and that's pretty much where it has stayed in the last few years. You know, we have very strong international recruitment services. We have intensive English language programs that we'll be talking about. We offer conditional admission you know, all to support our international enrollments that we have on campus. Um, but they're just the, the percentage wise, it's not as um, large as, as UC system and some, some of the other state universities. You know, the CSU systems in general get their revenue from tuition, from um, on-campus housing, as well as um, from the state of California. And basically enrollments is a very strong component. And that's why for this year, um, and I think for a couple few years because of the pandemic, you know, enrollments are going to be um, stressed out a little bit, I would think. And all the CSUs are going to get very creative in terms of how they'll be recruiting domestic students, um, transfer students, as well as international students. This gives you a breakdown. And I'm sure since it's being recorded, you'll be able to see it yourself, as well as I'll be able to send this PDF form to Luke that you guys can get online and see um, the breakdown of the 
student national population. That link at the bottom that you see there, this would allow you to go on the CSU site. It's like a live dashboard where you can click on a CSU that you have interest in and it'll bring up the international populations, the countries that are represented, and a lot of different information like that. So this kind of is a breakdown I put into a spreadsheet. And you can see the, the at least the top 20 here of the international students and the countries that they're from, and then breaking even down further. I guess before looking here, you can see those negative numbers. So you can see there is um, some dynamics going on in terms of our um, international students coming to our campuses. There's been some plus and then some pretty strong um, drops in, in enrollment. Um, looking at this page too, it gets pretty much down to um, single digit numbers. Um, but overall, you know, we have a wide, wide diversity of international students on our campuses. And next we're going to be talking about uh, quickly going through what the Cal State Apply application looks like. And the reason we bring it up is because it's unique, um, this Cal State Apply application, it does represent um, a singular online application for all international students and domestic students as well. So basically anyone that wants to go to a California State University, um, they have to go to this online application site and be able to complete the application as well as choose the institutions that they want their application sent to. And for every application they send, there's a $70 application fee. This is kind of like the dashboard of it. So this is how the application starts. We won't get into the detail of this application process, but I wanted to highlight just the support that international students have when completing this application. There are four main stages that the international student has to complete. And you can kind of see those disks that are now gray that will eventually go green as the students complete their the different uh, sectors of the application. Initially, they start out with some information that they have to see that's specific to the California State University, such as the English proficiency requirement, um, uh, grade level, GPA requirements, as well as um, other international student requirements. And so on this page, on this site, they'd be able to click on and find the specific information needed for that CSU. And here's a drop down box which kind of shows the breakdown of the CSU. So, as they're completing this application, they can go look at other CSUs and see what the requirements are for that CSU um, application system. And then you'll also be able to check, see datelines or application dates and deadlines. Um, almost all the uh, CSU system are on semesters. But there are still one or two, I believe, that are transitioning from a quarter system to the semester system. So that's important for the students to know what type of um, um, calendar system that the CSU is on. But in generally, I think 21 of them are on the semester system. And these sites would be able to tell those students what the application sites and what their calendar looks like. So students will also be able to go through a checklist to make sure they're on track to submit the documentation needed for their application. And once they get through that um, site um, to fill out the, the profile information, then they'll be able to select the international application to make sure they're completing the right one for, their, for the international students. After that, they'll be able to select what type of student that they are. If they're gonna be a graduating student, a first time freshman, if they're transferring from a California State or California Community College, which has their own um, pathways that are go from a CS, California Community College over to a CSU system. And then there's also students that would be transferring from outside of the state of California, whether they're um, not a Cal, uh, community college or for other two or four year institution. And then there's opportunities if students are seeking a second bachelor. So by checking these boxes, it will determine what type of programs that will show up on the student's application. Because once they, once they pick the, the institution that they want to complete the application for, you'll see that the, based upon if they're transfer, first time freshman, graduate, the classes or the programs that are eligible for that status will show up underneath, underneath the university. And so it'll be again important to select the campus, the format that they would want the classes, the type of student that they are, and that will dictate what type of programs are available for that student. 
um, getting through the rest of the international questions. This is also unique to the CSU application. If a student is working with an agency or some support system that um, needs to be recognized on the application, they would have this section here where they'd be able to put the agent's name or the person that's um, helping them with the application, as well as the type of relationship and that information. And so that information will then get sent to the CSU and so they'd be able to tell if they were working with a third party. And so this information is tracked on the online application. As you can see, as you get through the personal information, the stuff gets tracked. And here is a section where the students would then be starting to complete their academic history. This would be basically their transcripts. And so they would be documenting information off their transcripts onto this online um, transcript service. Um, as they complete this transcript sections, once they complete enough of the requirement, it says it's okay and, and they can move forward. One thing that's important to note here is that while they're completing this sections and putting in their coursework and their tests and things that they've taken, especially the transcripts, the students will be required to send us official transcripts. So in the end, the International Admissions Office will use this information as a reference but the counselors and admissions officers will be looking and reviewing the official transcripts that need to be um, submitted to the CSU in order to be evaluated. They won't do the evaluations online. They're gonna be evaluating the official transcripts that are sent into the CSU system. Then finally, once they're done, the applications that are complete, they'd be able to go and check the status of the applications that they sent. Um, once the applications are accepted by the CSUs, the CSU will send their own, like Sonoma State will send their own um, letter of recognition. They also, if it's been accepted, they'll send them a student ID number, they'll be able to send them a email address, and they'll also send them what's called, at least for us, it's called My SSU or specific to that CSU, which is basically the student portal where they'd be able to track the material that they need, that they need to submit to the um, CSU system or the application process. So all this stuff is done online. And once this information is sent to the CSU system, then the admissions office kicks in. Prior to that, if the international students have questions about the application, there's a 24 hour service that they'd be able to check um, and speak either through chat or potentially online or through email with a person if they have questions about the application prior to submitting it to the CSU that they would like it be um, that they're applying to. And so once that's all done, then they'll be able to see the feet. Oh, this is different. Um, once it's all done, then the CSU takes over and starts that direct um, conversation. This is one thing that's also to know about the application fee waivers. We get a lot of questions from international students, from agencies, um, how they can waive the application fee. Well, since it's a centralized CSU application, the application fee the money, the $70, does not come to the CSU. That money goes to the Chancellor's Office. So we have no control over trying to waive the application fee. That is something that's separate. So students, in general, are going to have to pay the application fee. You can see the eligibility requirement on the bottom where it says you have to be a California resident, a U.S. citizen. Um, so the application fee, whatever, is just not available for international students. And then finally, once we're done with the applications, they'll be able to print, um, get, or print to a PDF or print out on paper and save those applications to use for future reference. And so that in a nutshell is kind of the online application, the Cal State Apply application. Um, it's gone through a few iterations. It's gotten better from what first came out a couple of years ago. Um, questions that were asked that were kind of mixed up with domestic students that didn't pertain to international students because they've refined the international application, it's a lot more streamlined and easier to use. And you know, we are fully there to support international students that are looking to complete this application. We have PDFs of screenshots like this that you could have and be able to use as a reference for any students that are going through this process and need a little help. And that's kind of it for the um, Cal State Apply application and a little bit about the CSU system. Miffy is now going to talk about the admissions requirements for the Cal State Apply or the California State University system. Ready, Miffy? Yes. 
So we just talked about, um, we have 23 different campuses in the system and then everybody kind of have different major and we offer from uh, undergraduate degree all the way to PhD degree. So obviously there's different ways to get into one of the campuses and the requirements are uh, gonna be a little bit different uh, depending which campus the student is gonna uh, apply. So one of the most direct way to get into a CSU school is obviously apply to it directly. We call it direct admission. Um, if a student uh, meets all the admission requirements, he or she should um, uh, apply to one of the campus directly. Um, so basically, whether it's an undergraduate degree or a graduate degree, a couple of the things that are required across the board for all 23 campuses. Uh, the first thing is high school GPA or university GPA. In most cases, it's 3.0. Uh, out of 4.0. And obviously international students have all different format or different kinds of grading system. And most of the campus will have an internal evaluation. So when the student apply, they submit their transcript, uh, whatever the campus they apply to, the admission office will have an in internal evaluation system to uh, help determine the equivalency of a US GPA system. So that's the first uh, requirement. The second one, obviously, for most international students are going to be the English proficiency. Let's use TOEFL as an example. So again, 23 campuses has different kind of requirements. Uh, so usually it's between 61 to 80 if we're talking about TOEFL and depends on the campus and also programs in the campus. Uh, for example, um, San Jose State University, they, most of the major are 61, but the engineering program are 80. So it really depends on which campus and which program the student apply to. SAT and ACT, it's not required for undergraduate uh, degree uh, seeking student. So that's a good news for a lot of the international student. Um, when it comes to applying to a graduate degree program, GRE and GMAT may be required, depends on the campus and the program, as well as some of the academic supporting document for a graduate program, such as a statement of purposes or a CV or recommendations letter. But all these supporting documents usually are not required for undergraduate degree, only for students who are applying to a graduate degree program, they, a different major will have a different requirement in terms of supporting documents. So next one, we're gonna talk about another way to get into a, a CSU campus. I, I believe most of you uh, know uh, what is conditional admission. So we just talk about high school or university GPA requirements are usually gonna be 3.0. A lot of those international students meet this requirement, but for some reason, they do not have uh, an English proficiency or they took the TOEFL some time, but the score is not high enough. So what, what are they gonna do? They can still apply uh, for a conditional admission and then they can study in uh, a language school in one of the uh, campus to prepare for their English. Whenever their English is, meets the requirement, that's when they can fully matriculate to a degree program. And therefore, usually English proficiency is not required for those who wanted to apply to a conditional admission program. SAT and ACT, again, it's not required for undergraduate studies. GMAT and GRE, it's not usually required when students apply to conditional admission. However, before they matriculate to their graduate degree program, uh, some campuses or some programs will be asking the student to provide uh, either a GMAT or a GRE score. And then, we're gonna talk about the next way to enter in CSU campus. So pathway program, and 
I think this is another term most of you are very familiar with, especially for the past several, several years. Um, so student, again, they meet their GPA requirement, whether it's they're looking for an undergraduate study or a graduate study. And they do have some English proficiency, but just, again, not there yet. So instead of having them focus on their English, taking ESL program, for some qualified student, there, there is an option for them to take university level classes. So then they are doing two things at the same time and which will save them a lot of time when they fully matriculate to the degree program. Um, we're gonna use one of the campus, our campus SDSU as an example. We asked for a minimum uh, TOEFL score for 49 in order for a student to be eligible for a pathway program. So then at this, when they are taking ESL program to improve their English, they are also allowed to take one or two uh, university level classes, earn official university credits. And so that when they fully matriculate, these students are bringing some university credits into their uh, degree study program. It definitely saved them some time and then even sometimes uh, save them on tuition as well. And again, SAT and ACT, it's not required if they are looking for undergraduate degree. And GMAT and GRE usually is not required when they take the pathway program, but it can be required when they, uh, before they can fully matriculate to um, one of the campuses or programs. So then I'll give it back to John to talk about Sonoma State University. All right, thanks, Miffy. Um, we, since we have two universities that are represented here, we're going to have two different types of um, non-degree intensive English programs that um, kind of show the broad range that the CSUs offer in terms of the CSU system. Here's just some pictures of our campus. You can see that since we're up in Northern California, um, there's it's a very residential style. You know, there's less than 9,000 students. Our residence halls are, you can see, are located right around the outside of the campus. And we have a lot of centralized um, cafeteria and student services and kind of makes up a, a different type of atmosphere than say more of an urban downtown type of university. This kind of shows a little bit of the location itself. You can see where San Francisco is. And then you go up Highway 101, which goes over the Golden Gate Bridge goes through Marin County, and in about an hour and a half, you're gonna be at, at Sonoma State University. On the right, you can see our um, enrollments. You can see the, the breadth of the enrollments that are at the 23 campuses. And we always are looking, and I think you know, every CSU is looking for the students that are, are gonna be a fit for our universities, whether it's the uh, ones that want an urban, one that want a, um, a coastal kind of beach um, lifestyle and studies, or are they ones that are looking more for internal um, different types of, of cities that they want to study in and live in, um, all present really great opportunities in the state of California. Um, I was just going to bring up a couple of things that I want to showcase about Sonoma State University, since we are an NYN country um, for our academic programs, I just was going to highlight a couple. We are more of a liberal studies campus and we just have good um, business programs as well as computer science. But um, one thing that is unique and it was, is a niche for us is because we're in wine country, we have the only undergraduate wine business program, which is kind of neat on campus. And this is the building that houses that. And then we also have the only wine MBA and executive wine MBA and global executive wine MBA. And essentially what the executive and a global wine MBA is that they're hybrid where they're taught off campus um, and then they're also taught in different parts of the world to help do case studies at different wineries and stuff so it's very unique that we have this wine program there the other thing that we have is our music center um, which um, if you have wine you have to have music and so we have a great music program that's our green music center not related to me um, but you can see in the back of it it opens up so there's about a thousand seats on the inside and then the green lawn amphitheater on the outside, which fits another 3,000 
and there's some um, screens that project that they don't show. So they have large indoor outdoor concerts. Um, the other IEP non-degree programs are gonna highlight really quick. Um, we've changed our UPP, uh, our intensive English program to a UPP program. It's not a pathway, but instead of having four levels of English, um, we are just looking, um, we've created just one level of English. And so students are gonna have to have a minimum English language score in order to be admitted into our UPP program. And we're looking for students that either wanna to matriculate to Sonoma State University. And so they're gonna be conditionally admitted or they have the ability to go to the local community colleges um, because um, as of this year, um, we're gonna be the only intensive English language program in the North Bay area, north of um, San Francisco and south of Chico and Sac State, they have their own programs um, because ELS now has pulled out that whole region. And so that's putting us in a unique position of our language program to support all the community colleges um, in the area and have students that would be able to stay on our campus, take our English language programs, and then after they complete the requirements, get a waiver to go attend their academic studies either at our institution or at the community colleges. The ACE program is more for our university partners abroad that send us students, very popular program that we offer with, um, in addition to practicing English, um, they also have large cultural service learning, academic opportunities, uh, as well as a lot of interesting travel that we take them to. Um, and students in that um, program usually are staying for one semester or a customized short-term program. The other programs we have is our semester at program, and that's basically international students coming as a non-degree student, taking academic classes with, with domestic Sonoma State students and the classes that they normally get into have to meet their prerequisites. So if they're doing upper level classes, they have to send us their transcripts and we have to verify that they have the ability to um, excel in the classes that they're taking. And in some cases, we use this our semester at Sonoma program as like conditional admissions. Um, so students that might need some undergraduate classes before they go to say computer science or even the MBA program, they can take them through our semester at program. And then the World Chat program is just a, um, an online English conversation program that we're now running. It, it coincides with our global studies undergraduate students that need contact time for them to graduate from their program. So this year might be a little bit difficult to run the program with the students being remote, but we're excited to offer this as well for students that just wanna practice English, speak to an American college student and learn about everything in Northern California. And so I believe that's all I have. And so now we're gonna roll this over to Chad. Okay, great. Hi everybody, hello again, I should say. Um, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna briefly talk to you about San Diego State. And I noticed we're running a little bit behind on time and we did promise to leave plenty of room for a question and answer. So I'll kind of go through what San Diego State has to offer. But like John said, the CSU system, we have 23 campuses. It's so diverse, be it geographically, the makeup of the students, the makeup of the programs or otherwise. With San Diego State, you've got a school that's almost 40,000 students. Um, it's one of the higher ranking universities in the CSU, certainly in the US as well. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a to each their own kind of thing. We've got some students like the bigger classes in the traditional big campus atmosphere and like the traditional American college experience they see in Hollywood movies. That's basically what San Diego State has to offer. I mean, in addition to being a research oriented school and otherwise known for business, but we've got really like this great vibrant campus that's got diversity and just all kinds of students from not only all over the world, all over the US. A couple of years ago, we were in the top three in as far as like applications received um, in the United States. So very popular school, not incredibly easy to get into, but those that get in absolutely love it. Um, I would imagine most of you know the location and you can see here a few notes about the city. What we kind of pride ourselves on is, and it's not what we're boasting, but what students tell us, people in San Diego are so friendly and they feel so comfortable living here. 
It's the eighth biggest city in the US, yet it feels small. And it's, of course, we've got the beaches. And so that kind of adds a casual vibe to the students, to the campus, to the city. Um, so it's a nice mix. It's a great stress reliever for students once they're out of class and there's a ton of things to do, as you can see, you know, on the bullet points. So I don't have to go through all those. We'll, we'll kind of move on to the next slide. Um, our campus, like I said, it's this big sprawling campus. It'll take you over well over an hour to walk around beautiful white Spanish buildings and palm trees everywhere. Thus why I said a lot of our international students say, it looks like I'm studying on like a Hollywood set for a university movie. So um, that's kind of what it looks like. And on the next slide, you see a few of the demographics um, with the international students, how we're represented, how many countries. I've already talked about the diversity. San Diego is a fun city. The rankings, as you can see there, um, you know, in certain parts of the world, rankings are incredibly important. I always kind of preach, you know, get beyond the rankings in, because you really need to find the program that fits you. Um, you need to find the city that fits you and the, the campus environment that fits you. So I really preach to students that they should be looking at everything, not just rankings. Um, and I know in some countries like uh, India and China, that doesn't go very far and they, that's really what they and their parents wanna focus on. So we've got that, but we've also got a lot more to offer. Um, just as far as campus life, because um, John was telling you a little bit about his school and that's obviously much smaller. Um, we've got over 300 student clubs and the students can participate in things like intramural teams and um, concerts and at sports activities with free tickets and they really get like the full experience of what it's like to actually be an American student on an American campus. So it's kind of like, like I said, it's the big traditional university if your students are looking for that this is definitely where they would want to go um, just to highlight a few things obviously like i said we were also a research university we're known for our business um, we have very high rankings in that um, undergrad grad phds pathways um, miffy kind of touched on those earlier so i won't go into too many details on those um, but it's just a nice way for students especially from you know, Southeast Asia, Latin America, some of the countries where they're English, it doesn't, you know, it's certainly not taught in schools as early as it is in other countries where we can just get them conditionally admitted, um, get their English up to a certain level, and they're into the university and on their way to a degree. A few of the programs I've kind of already touched on and Miffy did a little bit as well, but we like to, we're talking about this because it's important that students know if they don't get into a degree program with a direct admit, there's different, definitely different avenues. I mean, they can take a semester or actually two semesters back to back where they're already getting you know, college credit um, that could be toward a degree. And they're taking the classes with their American students. They're in the regular classes. So um, a semester program is a great option. Um, some students, if their English, like I said, is not good enough, they'll start with an IEP program and they'll kind of maybe segue into a English for academic purposes program. There's summer programs. And so a lot of students will come for an IEP or an academic program that's maybe it's only four weeks and they just fall in love with the city or the school and they're like, man, I'm coming back here. And you know what, we see them actually. So um, it's like I said, I wanna keep mine short so we like, plenty of time for question and answer. You can see our contact info there um, and our campus as well. But um, yeah, as promised, I'm gonna turn it back over to Luke probably. And we've seen a few questions already in the chat that Miffy and I were trying to answer and John as well. But let's right now, I guess, open it up to you guys and see what, you, uh, what other things you are wanting to know. Okay, thank you so much, Chad, John and Miffy uh, for the great presentations. Uh, and thank you for uh, trying to answer some of the questions that have been coming up in the chat. I think you covered most of the uh, questions already. There was a question about the application fee. Uh, so if a, if a student applies to more than one CSU campus, does the student have to kind of pay the fee per institution? I think that has been answered. Uh, the student does have to pay uh, fee separately. In, um, and there was a question, also a question about, sorry. There was also a question about, um, where is it? I'm oh, sorry, I, I've been having some technical difficulties. Oh, here we go. And there was a question, 
uh, about like the minimum IELTS score. Um, uh, and then I, I missed the answer to the question, 5.5 for IELTS. And of course, um, uh, what's great about the CESU system is that even if you, even if students don't meet the minimum requirement for the degree program, there are pathways and other ways uh, to get into the system. Um, and if that's the case, if a student is applying for a non-degree program, that then the student will have to kind of follow, uh, use a separate application and platform, not this, the Cal State apply uh, for pathways and um, IEP program, conditional admission, uh, and so on. And we do have another question. Um, uh, this is from uh, um, our advisor from the Philippines, um, Christine. The students who transition from community college to Cal State get a fairly good shot at like, scholarship opportunities or are freshman students likely to get bigger opportunities for eight. So that it's a question about scholarships and then the chance of getting scholarships. Yeah, I, I just, I just uh, answer that because okay. we are a public uh, university system, at least for the undergraduate level, in most cases, scholarships or financial aids are only available to domestic students, which is uh, American students. So for international students, those are usually not available. However, because we are a public university system, our tuition are really, I don't want to say uh, cheap, but it's reasonable and it's very compatible, especially if we compare to public university. Uh, for graduate degree level student, there might be um, some opportunities um, for either, they call it scholarship or uh, uh, tuition the, waiver yeah. um, or something like a grant for like research project. So uh, therefore, uh, usually for undergraduate level, the uh, scholarship or financial aid are not available to international students, whether they are freshmen or they apply through a community college. Yeah, I would just add one thing really quick to that is there is an option for students. I always tell them like, don't despair. There's still one avenue where they can actually work on campus for 20 hours a week, a part-time job. Um, and it actually adds up quite quickly. It could almost pay for their, their room and board. Um, and there are often jobs like in the library, in the student center, or in a dormitory at the check-in counter, things like that. So I always tell students that's, you know, look into that and each campus has their own way of kind of posting those jobs that are, that are open to all students. Okay, uh, thank you. And then we have another question from Education USA Brunei, Amira. Uh, so can IB and A-level students transfer credits to CSU? Uh, I think uh, to add to that, um, uh, some countries follow the British uh, curriculum uh, for their schools. So uh, they've been wondering, can, uh, do you accept uh, scores like IB scores and A-level scores? And do you also accept uh, credit transfers for like college level courses? Like they, at Sonoma State, we accept, um, we do our own evaluations in-house of transcripts, you know, our, our international volumes uh, lower, and we do accept up to 60 units of transfer classes. So it's basically just like a transfer student. Community college students can transfer 60 units to be an upper division transfer students, and that would be the same for international students. And in terms of the IB or A level, I'm not that familiar with it, maybe Miffy or Chad can follow up on that one accepting those classes because I haven't run into that situation. Um, I, I, I encounter all, uh, a lot of these kind of questions uh, before whether it's AB or um, IB or AP or A level or O level. It seems like there's all kinds of different courses coming out uh, in the world and uh, Obviously, students are, you know, everywhere and everybody is concerned about that. I believe IB for sure, uh, I want to say for sure it's, uh, it's accepted, but I am not sure exactly what is the maximum that they can uh, apply to their degree program. Um, but we are more than happy to uh, consult with our other people in our international admission team so they will be able to provide more accurate information uh, regarding these questions. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that uh, it's possible that you look at them and then you accept them, mm -hmm. but there might be a limit to the number of credits that can be transferred. Right. Uh, okay, great. Yes. 
All right, yeah, um, advisors, uh, yeah, please feel free to um, can you type see, your questions in the, yes? I see Violet has a question. Do you have online courses for international students? Um, we were obviously going to have online courses for international students starting this fall for Sonoma State. You know, we don't have, um, we have hybrid programs, but we don't have online classes um, specifically or online degree programs are either hybrid or face-to-face. Sure. Uh, a follow-up question on, on that yeah, is that there uh, we see um, Cal State U on the news a lot uh, these days, uh, making announcement about the uh, the fall semester and possibly the, the next academic year. I think your chancellor uh, um, had a, a kind of a press conference or like a public hearing, and then he, um, and, and made some announcement about possibly having a full year virtually. Um, can you comment on like what's happening and if you know it, when a chancellor makes that type of announcement, can we take that as something that will be applied across the CSC system? I can say that you know the chancellor you know relayed that information, but still left it up to the universities to decide. And you know we're hybrid, and I think most of the like, CSU campuses are hybrid. You know, the CSUs and the UC systems, you know, they're pretty independent spirited. The UC system even more so. I don't think anyone can ever tell Berkeley what to do or UCLA, they just do whatever they want to do. And maybe SDSU is like that as well because they're so big. But, um, you know, we're hybrid and how we were gonna support our international students and luckily most of them were already in country in the United States that um, we were just going to have our professors change um, their online courses to face-to-face -face courses for international students and make it a hybrid situation. So for us, it was kind of simple because um, of our population side. We were just going to work with our faculty and, and have them change them from being online 100% to hybrid and allowing international students to come back on campus to meet those requirements. Now that's not the case anymore, but that's how we were going to adjust to it. So each CSU, depending upon their international volume, was going to definitely make accommodations for international students so they can be supported completely through this, this next academic year. I see. So, mm -hmm. so, the, so the discussion may be up there you know, on that level, but it's up to individual university to you know, take uh, what makes sense to them and apply. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything from uh, Mifi uh, or, or Chad on that? Um, yes, yeah, so like John mentioned, uh, the chancellor's office definitely have some, you know, announcement or like an overall kind of direction for the entire system, but it is up to each campus to uh, make their own plan uh, depending on their own situation. And obviously, even for the trans chancellor's office, they are, they can only speak to what the current situation is. We don't know. The COVID 19 situation may get better. We all hope that it's going to get better and then maybe in the spring uh, semester we will, you know, back to fully a uh, normal operation. But at this point, we, we know for sure the fall we are going to have, at least for SDSU, we are going to have what we call SDSU flex. So most of the classes are going to be online, whether it's for international student or for domestic student. Um, but we do have some classes that you have to be there in person, like, for example, the lab or clinical kind of thing. You can't really do that in virtual uh, format. And therefore, those classes, we have about 200 different classes that are deemed only in person. Um, so I guess in general, we can also call it a hybrid situation. So uh, again, it really depends on each campus to make their own plan and uh, um, uh, decisions. Yeah, just to follow up on that, like SDSU submitted our plan to the, the CSU Chancellor's Office for approval, and we have over 200 classes that we're going to be teaching face to face. So, um, like Miffy said, a lot of them are the research oriented laboratory classes that basically it's a necessity for those things to happen. And I know that some of the IEP programs, the CSU IEP programs, submitted their plans to make their IEP classes essential so that students could come on campus to take the IEP classes. And so offhand, I'm not sure, I think is maybe Northridge and some of the other ones down south that um, made their IEP classes 
essential. And so some didn't like us. Ours, you know, we weren't going to do that and we weren't going to go online. So we went on, on hiatus and some other programs went, I think like SDSU, they were going to go all online to support their students. So um, we can always kind of help or reach out directly to the CSUs where there might be interest to see how they want to support, especially through their IEP programs, if they're going to be hybrid online or face-to-face. -face. Okay, uh, and there is a follow-up question, uh, I guess, um, on that IB and A levels. Uh, would it help for students to submit their transcript through credential evaluators, like WES mm -hmm. or NECES, um, to help with yeah. the evaluation? I would say that if it depends on the campus. If a it campus does. admission office has its own evaluations team or system, I would not encourage students to you know, waste their money on a third party evaluator. It's just really just from a student kind of perspective. Like if the student, if the school offers the inter, uh, evaluation, why waste their money and energy mm -hmm. to a third party um, uh, company and sometimes like for example SDSU they uh, I guess I should say different company have different rep, uh, reputation sometimes um, not necessarily we everybody are very familiar with WES but not all campus accept their evaluation report so I think um, it's a case-by-case -case situation and students should definitely check with uh, the international admission in that campus and to determine whether he or she should uh, go with a third party or should just send the transcript directly to the campus so that they can do an internal evaluation. It may take a little bit longer time, to be honest, but at least the student would not have to waste uh, their money to do that evaluation. Mm -hmm. So we can take it as like, being flexible, you know, it, there isn't a rigid system that you must follow, the rigid step you must follow in order to get uh, your emissions and materials uh, evaluated. Uh, but you can always work with the international uh, offices. Yeah. Uh, yes. All righty, thank you. Uh, any other question? Just gonna make sure that I'm not missing any question that's been raised. Well, I, think, I think we got them, okay. at least the written ones. And, and, and advisor, feel free to unmute your mic if you have, if you want to ask questions directly. Well, we just really appreciate this opportunity to get in front of this um, this group of people. It's really exciting to see that you guys are um, getting together yourselves and with everything that's going on in the United States to kind of network amongst yourselves and see what best practices are going on in light of all the pandemic and everything else that's going on. You know, we're kind of just forging ahead in many ways in California to roll out things and then move back because of the, you know, the virus surging in some places and not in the others. And so it's a really dynamic time and we're really glad that um, you guys are out there um, supporting, you know, U.S. higher education. Yeah, uh, and thank you, John. Um, um, I, and my understanding that uh, you have been putting in a lot of effort into building this presentation so you can kind of present as a team. And, uh, and then you did mention that you, want, you might be interested in doing individual presentations uh, for different country teams uh, in the month of August. Can you talk yeah. about a little bit more? Yeah, definitely. We, there's opportunities, you know, you know, the colleagues that I have here, San Diego State and myself, we're kind of re you know, representing you know, the diversity of the campus, but we're ready to present you know, specific presentations, um, get a little um, questions beforehand. We can focus on certain aspects of maybe the application system, maybe the IEP programs, maybe pathways, conditional emissions, because like I said, everyone's a little bit different, but if we um, have requests to kind of narrow down the presentations, we definitely can focus on that, bringing resources from other CSUs. You know, they know that we're doing these presentations and, um, they're excited that we're helping them represent the institutions, um, you know, the CSU system abroad. And if there's anything that wants to be going to more depth, a little drill down on certain things, we'd be happy to do it. It's all online yeah, these definitely. days. You won't be seeing us in person. So this is how we're going to do it. Exactly.
But but like John said earlier, it, it's nice that we could, it, it was almost appropriate that San Diego State and Sonoma were at least kind of presenting together today because you really see the diversity of the CSU system from size to location to, you know, the makeup of the school. So we just tried to give you a little bit today and it's hard to squeeze a lot into 45 minutes when it's such a vast topic. But yeah, like John said, we're happy to drill down further as, as needed for any one of you that wants to request it. Yeah, so feel free to connect with them. They're willing to, more than willing to do uh, webinars with your own uh, country teams as well for your uh, students and parents. Um, and it was interesting uh, when John pulled the data on the top, uh, you know, countries of origin for a CSU. I, I think we saw like 20 countries and like, I think I, I, did, I did a quick count. About 15 of them uh, were in the EAP. So there is definitely interest uh, among students in our region. So please feel free to reach out. Uh, and so, and we are out of time. I'm gonna stop recording. I, want, I just wanna say thank you, uh, advisor for coming and thank you to our speakers, um, you know, that have uh, put together the, the presentation and you know, it's like 10 p.m. in California. So thank you for taking the time out uh, in your evenings uh, to, to do this presentation.